Please join me in prayer for the word. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your son, Lord, who took our sin and our shame, was nailed to a cross, and died. Yet, Lord, he resurrected for us. He defeated sin, and Lord, through your grace and through faith in him, Lord, we have been called clean. Lord, you have given us his righteousness. So, Lord, we give you all praise and thanks, Lord, and we come before you. We pray, Lord, that we would now worship you, God, with all of our hearts, with all of our minds, with all of our strength, by listening and hearing your word. And we pray, Lord, that your word would truly transform us, mold us and shape us into your own image, that, Lord, through our lives, we may glorify you every day through your word. We pray this in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Christ is still risen. He is still risen indeed. We continue in Eastertide, celebrating the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and his victory over sin. I think a lot of times we spend so much time in anticipation of Easter, once we actually have Easter and it passes, we kind of just kind of forget or, or kind of that's it, right? But there, are, there is another season after Easter. It's called Eastertide. And we celebrate this just as much as we do Lent. Just as we spent 40 days before Easter in preparation, in, in meditating on the Lord's suffering, in leading up to Easter, let us now spend the next 40 days after Easter doing the same in meditating on the resurrection of Christ and the life that we have in him. Today's New Testament account in John, it occurs just a week after the resurrection of Christ. Just the prior week, we know that Jesus revealed himself to Mary Magdalene, and this was a passage that we actually read last week. After seeing Jesus, Mary Magdalene, she rushes to the disciples to tell them what she had seen, what she had experienced. She tells the disciples that the Lord is risen and that she has seen him. Yet, it seems that the disciples do not believe in Mary's testimony. Again, in the Gospel of Luke, we read of another account where the resurrected Christ, Jesus, he meets two disciples who are on their way to Emmaus. And once they realize who this is, that this is Jesus, the Lord, that he is risen, they rush back to Jerusalem and they also tell that they what, of what they've seen, the resurrected Lord. They tell this to the disciples, but we see that still the disciples don't believe them. They don't believe the testimony of Mary, and they don't believe the testimony of these other two disciples, even though they have seen Jesus. It was not until that very night, with the doors locked, that Jesus comes into the presence of the disciples, minus Thomas, and that's important because we're going to talk about that, And Jesus reveals himself to the disciples. And it's here where we read that the disciples finally believe that Jesus is risen. When the other disciples now, in turn, they realize Jesus is risen, they go to tell Thomas, who was not with them. They explain to him all that happened and how they saw the resurrected Christ, that Jesus is in fact risen. He has risen from the grave. However, Thomas doubted. He was a skeptic. He did not believe them. And so this is how he replies, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand in his side, I will never believe. What a a brazen, what an audacious response Thomas, one of the disciples, right? One of the very own disciples of Jesus Christ. He did not believe, not even when Mary testified, not even when the other two disciples who are on their way to Emmaus, when they testified, even when his own brothers, the disciples that had followed Christ with him, even when they testified of the risen Lord, he still 
did not believe. And not only did he not believe, but he said, unless I touch his wounds, he says, I will never believe. And so my question, and, and so from this account, we, we know that he has a, an infamous title given to him, Doubting Thomas. And so whenever we do something and, and we're doubtful, say, don't be a Doubting Thomas, right? And it's kind of like a condescending title, right? But my question this morning for us is, was Thomas actually a greater doubter than the rest, the rest of the disciples, the rest of us? And the answer is no. Now here's why. First of all, the others we see doubted just as much as Thomas. As I already mentioned, through, they didn't believe that Jesus was risen even through Mary's testimony and even through the other two disciples' testimony, their first-hand testimony that they had seen the risen Jesus. The other disciples did not believe them as well. In fact, it wasn't until Jesus presented himself to the disciples and showed them his wounds that they believed that he was risen. So the disciples, they're, they're not off the hook because they also didn't believe until they saw the wounds of Jesus. Also, to the credit of Thomas, when Jesus returned, we read in John that the doors were locked. Most scholars will agree that the disciples would have kept their doors locked because they were still afraid. They were afraid of persecution and they were afraid of being arrested because of being followers of Jesus. And so even after Remember, this is a week after they had that encounter with Jesus, the other disciples. They still locked their doors, which means that they were still afraid. They still hid in fear. All this is to say that just because of Thomas's confession here, I think he gets a, a worse rep than the other disciples. We don't say, oh, that doubting Peter or that doubting John, right? It's, oh, Peter, the, the, the rock, right? That's Peter. And John is the, the beloved disciple. But Thomas, he's a doubting one, right? He's doubting Thomas. Oh, my goodness, right? But if anything, Thomas isn't more of a doubter than the other disciples. If anything, all of them were equally faithless. They were all doubters. So why is Thomas singled out? Why, why do all the other disciples, just, it kind of just seems like they, they're glossed over their experience, but then Thomas is singled out for his doubt, for his confession, I will never believe. Well, the reason why, of course, is because Jesus was trying to teach the disciples a lesson. And Jesus is trying to teach us a lesson through his encounter with Thomas. You see, what we have to realize about the story about Thomas's doubt is that this story is not about Thomas. The story is about Jesus. Just like everything else in the Bible, it may seem like the stories are about Abraham or about Moses or about these other characters. But everything in the Bible is about God and points us to Jesus and who Jesus is. And just like that, this story is given to us even today so that we would know how Jesus loves us so much. The grace that Jesus has for us. The character of Jesus, who he is. Not just so that we can judge Thomas. Right? That's not why this story is given to us. We know that the disciples didn't understand. They didn't understand that Jesus would rise again. Constantly throughout his ministry, Jesus would tell the disciples, I'm going to die and I'm going to resurrect from the grave. And constantly they would say, oh, what, what are you talking about, Jesus? This doesn't make sense. Peter would say, no, you can't do that, not on my watch. And all these things, they did not understand that Jesus would die and that he would resurrect. In fact, he told them blatantly that he would destroy. He says, I will destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. 
What, what are you talking about, Jesus? What does that even mean? We understand that the disciples, before they saw Jesus, before they encountered Jesus, were just as clueless as we were before we knew Jesus and encountered Jesus. And so, their disbelief, their doubt in the resurrection of Jesus, it's not more heinous, it's not worse than our doubt, our skepticism, our unbelief before we knew Jesus. Jesus' intention was to make himself known to his disciples so that they would know his resurrection, that they would believe in him, and that he would commission them as his own apostles to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, and even the ends of the earth. We know that God knows everything. He knows all. And so he could, Jesus could have chosen a time where all of the disciples were together in that room, including Thomas, and then he came before them, peace be with you, and he showed them his wounds, and they believed in him. But he, he intentionally, he deliberately chose to come at a time where all of them were together except Thomas. And this is to show us how much he loves us. Why? On that night, a week after his resurrection, when he came to the disciples again, he came deliberately for Thomas. He wanted to let Thomas know, yes, I am also commissioning you as an apostle. Yes, you are also my disciple. Yes, you also must believe. He came deliberately to give Thomas faith. He came deliberately to show Thomas his love for him. He came deliberately to show Thomas the wounds that he bore for him. When Jesus came into the presence of his disciples, he already knew Thomas' doubt. He already knew Thomas' skepticism. He already knew Thomas' confession, I will never believe unless I touch his wounds. And so as Jesus comes into the presence of the disciples, he immediately goes to Thomas and he says, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. And then he says, do not disbelieve, but believe. I don't know about you, but I believe that in that moment, Thomas did not have to touch the wounds of Christ. Because in, in his response, Thomas, he says, he exclaims, my Lord and my God. And this isn't just an honorary title that he's giving to, to Jesus. He's not just trying to show respect to him. He's making it personal by saying, my, you are my Lord. You are my God. It's a vast contrast to the confession he makes to the disciples when he says, I will never believe. But once he sees, he just sees the risen Christ. His confession goes from, I will never believe, to you are my Lord, you are my God. It seems that Thomas's faith was in fact no worse than the rest of the disciples it was, it's no worse than our faith. And yet, Jesus still comes to Thomas. We see him purposefully reaching out to Thomas and giving him faith. And he says to him, Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. This message this story is for all of Jesus' disciples, then and now. Many believed in Jesus because they saw the resurrected Lord, because they saw Jesus. Remember, for 40 days, he revealed himself to hundreds of his disciples. He taught them the scriptures, the laws of Moses and the prophets. And they believed in him. And yet Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. For us, 
This is a story of our own doubt. Our doubt in God, our doubt in a savior, our our doubt in a resurrected Christ. But it is a story of God's grace to us, even in the midst of our doubt. This story is a story of our apathy, of our ignorance, of our indifference towards God, yet God's steadfast love for us. Because you see, we are all like these disciples. We are all like Thomas. Have we all not doubted God at some point in our lives? Have we all not not doubted his love? Have we all not doubted who he is or who we are in him at some point in our lives? Especially in this generation of skepticism. In our generation of this postmodern generation where it seems that you have to be suspicious of everything. (coughs) Excuse me. Our generation and our age, it tells us that we have to question everything. And all of the answers, all of the truths must be subjective, relative, which means that there really is no truth. Excuse me, I'm battling allergies. It's nothing else, it's just allergies. Please don't be suspicious of me. (laughs) And so especially in our our age of skepticism, our our postmodernism, a lot of scholars even have come up with these theories that, oh, Christ wasn't actually risen, or it was just an illusion, or the disciples were just dreaming, or they removed his body, or all these things, all to say, you can still doubt these things. You can still doubt the resurrection (coughs) of Christ, and that's okay, because you can still be a Christian. But how can we believe in redemption and salvation and the covering and the washing of the blood of Jesus without resurrection, without Christ defeating the grave. But that's how it is. That even with all of these eyewitness accounts, (coughs) I hope it's not coffee. funny because before I came to Delaware, this never happened. (laughs) But I still love Delaware, don't worry. Even with all of the accounts, with all of the historical evidence, with all of the, the writers, you know, being merely decades, right, within the time frame of Jesus' ministry, all these things, the validity of the writings, the validity of Christ's resurrection and Christianity and all these things in, in general, it's so hard to believe in Christ. It's so hard to believe in Jesus. And we can see that when you walk out the door, when you go into the world, there are so many who doubt. There are so many who cannot believe. Even in churches, there are so many who doubt. So then how can we believe? How are you and I sitting here worshiping God? How are we praising God for the resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ? I think Paul states it perfectly in Ephesians chapter 2. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. We are truly blessed. Not because we have seen Jesus, right, the physical Jesus resurrected from the grave, But we are even more blessed than those disciples because we don't have to see the physical resurrection of Christ, yet we still believe. And why is that? Why does that make us more blessed? Because God, in His sovereignty and His grace, has given us more faith to believe in the resurrection of Christ even without seeing Him. 
if we ought to learn anything about this passage, it's not that Thomas is a great doubter, but that God gives even more faith, faith even to the greatest doubter to believe in him, all in his will for his purpose and his glory. This story is not about doubting Thomas, but the story is about our gracious Jesus who gives us faith. Of course, this doesn't mean that we should just go around doubting God and doubting the resurrection and doubting Jesus. At times, there is validity to our doubts. When we're non-believing, we have doubts. Maybe we're struggling. Maybe we're immature in faith. Maybe we're a new convert, whatever it may be. There is validity at times for our doubts. Yet, if you truly know, if you have truly experienced the resurrected Lord, if God has given you true saving faith, then God calls us to stop doubting, to doubt no longer, and to believe. When we truly have the saving faith in Christ, we don't question who God is any longer. We don't question who we are in Christ any longer, but we have assurance in our identity in Him. We have assurance in the righteousness that He has imputed to us. We have insurance of the salvation that only He can give to us. In Matthew and, Luke, and Mark and Luke, we read that Jesus actually rebukes His disciples because they doubt. In Mark, Afterward, he appeared to the leaven themselves as they were reclining at table, and he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. And in Luke, he said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? As those who have been called by God, as those who have been given this saving faith in Christ, we are to believe and not doubt. For what comes out of doubt from a believer? Fear, indecisiveness, indifference, all of the things that pull us away from God, all the things that make us unable to follow Him wholeheartedly, all the things, this doubt and fear that causes us to question His love. All these things cause us not to glorify God, not to walk in his ways. And so, we are called to believe. And God has given his own son to us, Jesus Christ. He has given us his word, the very testimony of his own disciples, that we might believe that Jesus Christ is the Lord and that by believing, we might have life in his name. But more than that, today he has also given us his Holy Spirit. And it is through the Holy Spirit that we have assurance of faith and salvation in Jesus Christ. This Holy Spirit who is the seal, the guarantee of our inheritance. And so, let us have full assurance, full faith, without a doubt, that Jesus is the Christ and that he has given us salvation through his blood. This is why I love Reformed theology. This is why I'm a Calvinist. Not because I want to belong to the cool group, right? <clears throat> but because I believe that once God has given you this saving faith, he will not take it away from you and you cannot lose it. We look through all these examples. None of them deserved to be saved. The disciples didn't deserve to be given faith. Thomas didn't deserve to be given faith. We do, did not deserve to have salvation in the Lord. It is only God's to give to us and he does not take it away because of his grace and because of his mercy to us. We are elected, chosen, and adopted as heirs to Almighty God. 
And his love for us is unconditional in the sense that he will never take it away from us. Knowing this and knowing Christ, I cannot teach that you can lose your salvation. If he has given you faith, it is not mine to take away. Of course, sometimes we doubt God, we rebuke him, and we even turn away from him because we are sinners and because we're dumb. That's not why we're saved. If I was saved based on my intellect, based on my character, based on my deeds, I'd be in big trouble right now. But God saves me because of his purpose and his will, because of his grace and his mercy and love to me. Quickly, I wanna share my story of doubt. Hopefully it will encourage you. During my senior year of high school, it wasn't even two years into my conversion experience. I was converted at 16 years old. It was a very low and depressing and a very frustrating and angry point in my life. I was both immature as a person and immature as a Christian. And in my immaturity, I tried to run away from God. And I did everything I could to renounce God. I stopped going to church. I stopped reading my Bible, I stopped praying, I started to research other religions like atheism, and I was angry at God. After a while, one of my friends challenged me. He was a, he was a faithful believer in Christ, a close friend, and we would have debates and arguments about God. And one Friday night, <clears throat> they had Friday service at his church. He said, come to my church and, and, and experience God. And I said, you know what? I, I'm not going to church. And we got into a big argument, and long story short, he said, I guarantee you that if you come to church and you hear the gospel, that he will change your heart. And so being stubborn and arrogant, I said, okay, then if, if he doesn't, then that means you have to stop going to church and you have to renounce your faith in God. And he said, I'll, he said, I'll take your bet. And so that Friday evening, <clears throat> I went to church with my arms crossed, with, you know, angry face and sitting way in the back, like, oh, I'm not even going to listen to this. The worship starts, the praise starts, the praise team comes out and all that, and I'm just like, ah, oh, you know, stubborn as can be. I said, there's no God. This is all a show. The preacher that night was a guest preacher that they had. He came up to the stage. He starts sharing his story. <clears throat> he starts sharing his story about his doubt in God. He starts sharing his own story about how he ran away from God and God kept pulling him back. And it spoke to me that night. It spoke to me especially because the preacher happened to have the same name that my name was. And it was as if God was speaking to me that night. He kept saying, he had my name and he kept saying, me and I, and God did this to me, and I did this to God, but God kept doing this. And it, it, it was as if God was speaking to me that night. Obviously, I turned back to God. <laughs> he restored my faith that night. Sometimes we doubt. Sometimes we try to run away from God. If, if that's what you need to do, like me, then do it. But I guarantee you, God's not going to come to you with lightning, with fire and hail and brimstone. If you are genuine, and sometimes even if you're not like I was, simply because he is gracious, because he is loving and he is kind, he will come to us as he did to me that night. And he will show us his wounds, those nails that were meant for you and me. He will show us his scars and he will say to us, as he did to me that night, 
And as he did to Thomas so many years ago, he will say, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And so, let us doubt no longer. As Peter encourages us, let us long for pure spiritual milk that by it we may grow up into salvation. Let us be built up into the spiritual house, a holy priesthood, that we may see all that the Lord is doing in our lives, that we may believe. Last week in our Easter service, we read from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We read of the victory of Christ over the grave and sin in verses 55 and 56 and 7. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through his grace, through his mercy, he has given us victory through Jesus Christ. But this week, let us continue and read verse 58 that says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Let us, as the children of God, as the people of God, doubt no longer. Let us be steadfast and immovable that we may experience the work of God through our church, through our families, our community, and that we may praise him and give him all of the glory that he deserves. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for your grace and mercy. We thank you for your steadfast love and your kindness to us, that even in our doubt, even though we are like Thomas and we doubt you and sometimes we try to run away, so many times, Lord, we are not, we do not live the way that we, we, we ought to as Christians, yet in your grace in your love for us. You continue to call us. You continue to give us more faith. You continue to sanctify us even when we don't deserve. And so we praise you and we thank you, Lord, because you are such a great and a good God. We give you all the honor that you deserve. We pray, Lord, that you continue, Lord, to give us more faith. Continue, Lord, to move in us. Help us to be steadfast and immovable as your people that you may continue to work through us and that you may continue to receive glory through your church and through your people. And we pray this in your mighty name, Jesus Christ. Amen.